hello lovely people welcome back to my channel and if you're new hi I'm Olivia I cover strange stories and a lot of true crime so if you're into that feel free to subscribe now before I get into the story of Robert Berdella I do want to warn you that this is a very graphic and upsetting story there's a reason he is called the Kansas City Butcher in the 1980s, a lot of people in the Westport neighborhood of Kansas City, Missouri knew Robert Berdella. He seemed perhaps a bit odd, but not sinister. He didn't seem like someone who was keeping horrible, dark secrets. He didn't seem like someone who was doing unspeakable things inside 4315 Charlotte Street. And he didn't seem like a serial killer who took the lives of six men, but real monsters are never what they seem. Robert Andrew Berdella Jr. was born on January 31st, 1949 in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, the first of two sons. Berdella's father, Robert Berdella Sr., was a Catholic and raised his family in a deeply religious household. Berdella was intelligent and did well academically, though his teachers found him difficult to teach. He didn't socialize a lot with other students and was described as a loner. He had a speech impediment, wore thick glasses, had high blood pressure, and was described as unathletic. Unsurprisingly, he was a target for bullies at school, but also in his home life, his father, who valued sports, often compared him unfavorably to his younger brother, who was naturally athletic. Berdella's father was also physically and emotionally abusive towards his children, sometimes beating them with a leather strap. When Berdella reached puberty, he realized he was gay. He kept this a secret, which is understandable since it's Ohio in the 60s in a deeply religious household. But taking all of this together, it's a recipe for childhood trauma, which is not to excuse what he did later on, but he is not off to a great start. Then came 1965. He was only 16 years old when two monumental events occurred that shaped his life. The first was that he saw the movie The Collector, which is based off the novel of the same name by John Fowles. Spoiler alert, the plot revolves around a man who stalks and abducts a young woman he finds attractive and holds her captive in his basement, viewing her as a specimen. After several weeks, a woman dies of a contracted illness, despite her captor's efforts to keep her alive. This is why later on, in addition to being known as the Kansas City Butcher, Berdella is also known as the Collector. The second event was the death of Berdella's father, who died on Christmas Day in 1965 from a heart attack at age 39. His mother quickly remarried, which Berdella viewed as a form of betrayal against his father. As a result, he became increasingly withdrawn and became more involved in solitary activities including writing to pen pals in countries like Vietnam and Burma. These pen pals would send him a small thing like a stamp or a photograph. That led him to developing an avid interest in primitive art, photographs, antiques, and he began collecting these artifacts. Shortly after high school graduation in 1967, Berdella moved to Kansas City where he enrolled in the Kansas City Art Institute with aspirations of becoming a college professor. However, by his second year, he had become vocally anti-authoritarian and also became a minor drug dealer to other students. He was also regularly abusing alcohol at this point. By the time he was 19, he had two drug-related run-ins with the law. The first was he tried to sell methamphetamines to an undercover officer. He was arrested, but then he was released after posting bond and would later plead guilty to the offense and receive a five-year suspended sentence. Then one month after the first arrest, Berdella and two other students were arrested for possession of marijuana and LSD. This time he couldn't post bond and he spent five days in jail, although the charges against him would be dropped due to lack of evidence. Eventually the school wanted him out, not because of the drugs, this is art school in the 60s, but because of the animal torture, something that has often been tied to serial killers, something that Berdella engaged in at least three times during college. On two of these instances, he tortured a duck and a chicken in the presence of his peers, and in a third instance, he experimented with sedatives and tranquilizers on a dog. In December of 1969, Berdella voluntarily withdrew from college, but he chose to remain in Kansas City, living in the Westport neighborhood. 
at 4315 Charlotte Street. By this point, Brudella was openly gay. He had begun spending much of his free time with male sex workers, drug addicts, petty criminals, and runaways, the people the rest of society had abandoned. He would typically befriend these individuals, even let them live with him, then try to help them free themselves from their drug addictions or criminal lifestyles, and he was adamant that throughout much of the 1970s, he had no physical contact whatsoever with these individuals, telling neighbors he felt like a foster parent to many of them. To pay the bills, he began working as a cook, and he also had a side business where he sold art and antiques that he had collected from around the world. This seemed to be more of his passion and what he focused on later. Eventually, he would stop being a chef and actually rent out a flea market booth where he would sell these things. At least superficially, he seemed like a good guy. Starting in the late 1970s, he assisted in organizing activities from the South Hyde Park Crime Prevention and Neighborhood Association, becoming their chairman in the early 1980s and encouraging neighborhood watch patrols. For me, this draws a lot of parallels with John Wayne Gacy, who was also seen as a really good guy. He was involved in his community, but secretly he was also targeting young men and killing them. So beneath the facade was a predator for both of these men. Verdella often engaged in sexual relations with several of these young men and would establish a degree of control over them through loaning them money and allowing them to live rent-free at his house for periods of time. By the early 1980s, he increasingly relied on these young men for companionship while he was also increasingly becoming frustrated at those of them who ignored his efforts to guide their lives. By 1981, Bordello was working full-time at his flea market shop, which he had named Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, where he sold unusual antiques with a distinctly dark or occult theme. It wasn't very successful. He often had to resort to nefarious means to make ends meet. He also took lodgers in at his home to gain additional income. A fellow merchant who operated a booth adjacent to Burdella's was named Paul Howe, and soon Burdella became acquainted with Paul's younger son named Jerry. Even after Paul moved his business away, Jerry and Burdella maintained a casual friendship, and when Jerry was only 19 years old, he became Burdella's first victim. On July 5th, 1984, Burdella got Jerry into his car with the promise of driving him to a dance contest in Miriam. According to Burdella, he plied Jerry with alcohol, Valium, and azepromazine in his car until Jerry became unconscious. He took him home, then injected Jerry with a heavy tranquilizer and bound him to his bed for the next 28 hours. During this period of captivity, Burdella drugged, tortured, and raped him. Jerry repeatedly begged him to stop the abuse or questioned why Bradella was doing this to him, to which Bradella would either ignore, taunt, or threaten him. According to Bradella, Jerry either asphyxiated on his own vomit or died from a combination of wearing a gag and the drugs. Bradella says he tried to resuscitate him and that he never intended for Jerry to die, although it's just likely he wanted to keep him as a permanent slack slave. Birdella dragged his body to the basement where he suspended Jerry above a large cooking pot and made several incisions in the body before leaving it there overnight to allow the blood to drain. The next day, he dismembered the body using a chainsaw and boning knives before wrapping the sections in newspaper and trash bags. These bags were later placed inside larger trash bags, which Bordello placed outside for a garbage crew to collect and take to a landfill. To me, this seems very professional for his first kill. Perhaps he had just thought about it for a long time, but he doesn't seem to panic and knows exactly what to do, which is just chilling. This also established a pattern of killing and body disposal that he would use later on, as well as taking pictures and keeping a journal about the physical and sexual torture he inflicted on each of his victims. When Jerry's disappearance was investigated, Verdella was questioned, but he claimed to have driven the youth to marry him as promised and had not seen him since. And as far as I could find, the police pretty much left him alone. Bordello would later say that he had killed six, but by the police allowing this to stay open, they had killed more. 
On April 10, 1985, 23-year-old Robert Sheldon arrived at Burdella's house asking if he could stay for a short period of time. Robert had been a previous lodger there, and although he was responsible for paying rent, Burdella considered him an inconvenience. Burdello would later say he wasn't physically attracted to and held no malice towards Robert, but he still chose to drug and hold him captive on April 12th when he came home to find Robert intoxicated. Rather, he saw him as an individual who he could, quote, express some of the anger and frustration that I had toward other people on. Robert was drugged and held captive in the second floor bedroom for three days and subjected to various forms of torture, including putting drain cleaner in his eyes, needles under his fingertips, piano wire around his wrist, and caulking in his ears to limit his hearing. Three days after Burdella had begun holding Robert captive, on April 15th, a workman came over to repair the roof. Burdella chose to fatally suffocate Robert by putting a sack over his head and tightening it with a piece of rope so that he wouldn't be discovered by the workmen. He would later dissect Robert's body in the third story bathroom. On June 22, 1986, Burdella found 20-year-old Mark Wallace, whom he vaguely knew, hiding in his tool shed seeking shelter from a severe thunderstorm. Which is just the worst luck to hide in a serial killer's tool shed. Let's just agree to stay away from tool sheds. But Burdella invited him into his house and then offered to inject him with chlorpromazine because he said Mark looked tense and that it would calm him. 30 minutes later, Burdella decided to take him captive. He carried Mark to the second floor bedroom where he was held captive and tortured for almost a day. Mark died of a combination of the drugs, the gag, and a lack of oxygen. Burdella noted his time of death at 7 p.m. on June 23rd. On September 26, 1985, 25-year-old James Ferris called Burdella asking if he could stay at his house for a while. Burdella accepted with the specific intention of kidnapping James, whom he arranged to meet at a bar that evening. Despite the brutality he had subjected his first three victims to, Burdella claimed that James was the first victim upon whom he intentionally inflicted torture. Burdella brought him home and fed him a meal mixed with crushed tranquilizers. He then tied him to his bed and almost constantly tortured him for the next 27 hours. The torture included repeatedly administering electrical shocks to his shoulders and testicles and putting hypodermic needles into his neck and genitals. James eventually died from asphyxiation. He, along with Jerry, were the only two victims ever reported missing. Another of Burdella's former boarders, Todd Stoops, told police that both of these men had last been seen with Burdella, but with no other evidence to go on, the cases went cold. However, police told Stoops that he should stay away from Burdella. Unfortunately, that advice wasn't completely heeded since Burdella's next victim was Todd Stoops. He was a drug addict and occasional sex worker who, along with his wife, had briefly lived at Burdella's in 1984 two times. But after he had moved out, Berdella hadn't seen him again until by chance they met on June 17, 1986. Berdella invited him to his house with an offer of lunch and an added incentive of sex since Stoops wanted money for drugs. Berdella later told investigators that he had been extremely physically attracted to Todd and had held him captive for two weeks, gradually increasing his terror to make him a cooperative sex slave. Burdella used electrical shocks on Todd's closed eyes in an attempt to make him blind and injected drain cleaner into his throat to try to silence his screaming. Todd grew weaker over the course of these two weeks and on July 1st, 1986, he died from septic shock. In the spring of 1987, Burdella became friendly with 20-year-old Larry Wayne Pearson, who eventually lived with him. According to Burdella, he didn't initially intend to capture Larry, but formed the plan on June 23rd. After having bailed Larry out of jail, the young man began jokingly referring to his practice of robbing gay men in Wichita. That evening, Burdella ensured Larry became intoxicated before injecting him with chlorpromazine and moving him down to his basement where he bound him before Burdella injected his larynx with drain cleaner and repeatedly administered electrical shocks with a transformer. According to Burdella, Larry was by far his most cooperative victim. He rewarded him after five days in captivity by moving him up 
to his second floor bedroom where he was kept for the latter part of his six weeks in captivity. However, Larry finally snapped and bit Birdella's penis before screaming that he couldn't go on being treated in this manner. In retaliation, Birdella bludgeoned him with a tree limb and then suffocated him with a bag and ligature before driving himself to the hospital to treat his wound. Larry's body was later dismembered in the basement. Birdella initially stored his head in a plastic bag inside a freezer before he buried it in the backyard. Though Jerry and James were the only ones officially reported missing, among the transient sex worker and underground communities, the others' absences were noticed. Rumors began to swirl around Birdella. Several sex workers who had gone to his house told their friends that he would tie them up, inject them with drugs, and inflict pain through various methods. And some of these sex workers claimed to have seen some of the missing men's belongings inside of Birdella's house. However, Likely because they were afraid of getting arrested themselves, none of them went to the police. At 1 a.m. on March 29, 1988, Birdella abducted his last victim, 22-year-old Christopher Bryson, whom he lured to his house with the promise of payment for sex. Once at his house, Birdella knocked him unconscious with an iron bar, then bound him to his bed, where he was subjected to similar torture and abuse as the other victims. By his third day in captivity, Christopher had sufficiently gained enough trust from Birdella to persuade him to tie his hands in front of his body rather than over his head. Then, on April 2nd, 1988, a meter reader who was working on Charlotte Street saw something shocking a naked man leaping from a second story window. Christopher had managed to break free of his restraints by burning through them using a book of matches Verdella had left in his room and had jumped from a second floor window. Wearing nothing more than a dog collar around his neck and having broken his foot during the fall, Christopher ran towards the meter reader. The person led him to a neighbor's house where they immediately called the police. When four officers arrived on the scene, Christopher began telling them, a story that was almost too horrible to believe. He initially claimed to have been hitchhiking when a man in a brown Toyota Tercel picked him up and offered to take him a party, though later he would admit he was engaging in sex work. He told them he was kidnapped, raped, and tortured for four days before he escaped. Furthermore, the man who called himself Bob had kept him in a basement and then later bound him to a bed on the second floor of the house, repeatedly sodomizing him, beating him with a metal pole, electrocuting him, drugging him, and when he tried to scream, he would inject his throat with drain cleaner. Christopher said that Bob had shown him Polaroid pictures of men who appeared to be dead and that he warned Christopher if he didn't cooperate, he would end up in the trash just like them. As Christopher spoke, the police officers noticed that his eyes were red and swollen and he had physical damage across most of his body. Two of the officers stayed there to maintain surveillance on the property. One took Christopher to the hospital and the fourth officer called the Kansas City Police Department to request a formal search warrant for the property. Later at the police department, Christopher told them that his captor had shown him Polaroids of men, explaining that they had been his unsuccessful attempts to collect as sexual slaves. Verdella informed him that he had no intention of ever allowing him to leave, that he had killed before, and that if Christopher was uncooperative, he would increase his torture or kill him. On the afternoon of Christopher's escape, Berdella was arrested on charges pertaining to sexual assault. He declined to allow officers inside his home, but they got a search warrant. Once inside, police knew this would be a hard place to search. There were dog feces everywhere. It was stacked floor to ceiling with boxes, magazines, clothes, and random items. In the second floor bedroom, they found the evidence corroborating Christopher's story and more. Luminol tests showed massive amounts of blood, particularly in the basement, bathtub, and two trash cans. And just as Christopher had said, they found over 300 pictures of men in various stages of torture or sexual assault, and some of them appeared to be dead. They also found two human skulls, an envelope full of human teeth, and in a hallway, several human vertebrae that had been scarred by hacksaw and knife marks. After analyzing the skulls, one was determined to be a high-quality fake, likely from Verdella's store, but the other was very real and belonged to Robert Sheldon. Police found a hacksaw and chainsaw 
and then inside the chainsaw was still tissue, blood, and human hair, which was evidence that the murders took place at the home, so they got a warrant to dig up the property. In the backyard, they found another human skull and a small bone fragment. The skull was later identified as Larry Pearson's. And on top of a dresser was a stenographer's pad with Brudella's writing in it where he had kept logs of the torture and killing of each of his victims. There was also several newspaper clippings regarding a missing young man named Jerry Howell and both a wallet and a driving license belonging to the missing James Ferris. The Kansas City Police Department formed a task force to try to identify the men in the photos. Many of them corresponded to men who had gone missing after 1984, but with only the remains of two men found, prosecutors decided to only go forward with trying two of the men because they were the only ones they could prove to a jury. On July 22, 1988, he was charged with the murder of Larry Wayne Pearson. He pled guilty to that to avoid the death penalty. On September 2nd, he was charged with the murder of Robert Sheldon. His attorney arranged a plea deal that in exchange for his confessions, he would be given life imprisonment. So between December 13th and 15th, he confessed to his crimes in vivid detail. That's how we know so much about the crimes, more than we would have known just from his writings because a lot of those were encoded notation that he actually later explained to investigators. He confessed to the murders of six men starting in 1984. He was able to name all of his victims and he was adamant that those six were the only people he killed. He confessed that he had chosen five out of the six victims because he had unsuccessfully tried to steer them away from their lifestyles. Berdella saw these as personal failures and became frustrated. The only victim that didn't fall into this pattern was Mark Wallace, who had been seized in a moment of opportunity from the tool shed. He talked about how the collector had left such an impression on him and was a motivating psychological force in the actions he exhibited against his victims. He explained how he lured them in, and in graphic detail, he explained the physical, emotional, and sexual abuse which he had subjected them to. He did claim that he tried to prevent any of his victims from developing any form of malnutrition or infection by occasionally administering antibiotics or nutrients intravenously, which was likely because he wanted to keep them captive for longer, not out of any sense of kindness from him, because he confessed that once he decided to make someone a captive, they lost all sense of humanity in his eyes. He also admitted that the level of abuse he inflicted increased with each victim. On occasions during his final three victims' periods of captivity, he ceased making additions to his logs because he assumed the victims would not, quote, be able to make it much longer. He said the Polaroid images acted as both recordings of the events and trophies. You can see some of the Polaroids online today, but be warned, they are very graphic. Through his confessions, investigators learned that the bodies of the six victims were dismembered, put in trash bags, and later taken to the landfill. None of the bodies have ever been recovered. From behind bars, Berdella arranged to sell his collection through a series of auctions. The appraiser in charge called it, quote, mind-boggling accumulation of about 2,000 rare antiquities ordinary household goods, and an uncountable assortment of egregious junk. The bulk of the estate, including the house on Charlotte Street, was purchased by eccentric local millionaire and former bank robber, Derbert Dell Dunmeyer, who had it demolished in 1993. Bergello was incarcerated at Missouri State Penitentiary. In the fall of 1992, he wrote to a minister complaining that the prison officials weren't giving him his heart medication. On October 8, 1992, at 2 p.m., Brindella complained to prison staff of heart pains. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead from a heart attack at 3.55 p.m. He was 43 years old. And that is the story of Robert Brindella.